All right, so this is an interview with Lama Surya Das uh, at Garris Institute, July 2010. Lama Surya Das is the, um, the, the founder and, and lead teacher of the Dzogchen Foundation and has been coming here to the Garris Institute leading two retreats a year uh, since we started eight years ago. Uh, so, Lama Siridas, welcome back to the Garrison Institute for another retreat. It's nice to be here. It's always glad to have you here. On the banks of the mighty Hudson. <laughs> yes. So I wanted to ask you, firstly, explain the meaning of Dzogchen. It's a Tibetan word, and maybe not all of our viewers will actually know what that means. Well, Dzogchen, as you probably know, Rob, is a Tibetan meditation practice lineage not a school of Buddhism, but it's a practice. So it means the innate great perfection or wholeness or completeness of our own innate Buddha nature. So it's a way of accessing and discovering, recovering and actualizing, bringing to life our best, highest, truest self, finding out who and what we truly are and what we're doing here and making a positive contribution to the world. So it's a way of awakening, it's one of the great practice traditions of Tibetan Buddhism called the consummate practice of Tibetan Buddhism, Dzogchen, the natural great perfection, the innate great perfection, the luminous great completeness. There are many translations. And its goal is, uh, its goal is ultimately personal and, 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 and beyond that social transformation. Um, its goal is enlightenment, like enlightenment. all schools of Buddhism. But it, specifically its specialty is um, quick path, Vajra sh diamond shortcut to enlightenment, not through many lifetimes of schlepping to enlightenment. And of course, it's per individual and collective, goal-oriented, social and personal enlightenment, or whatever you want to call it, self-realization, awakening, awakefulness, a more sane, beautiful, and authentic life, here and ongoingly. And how does one, how does one, um, accomplish the shortcut? Is, it, is that just part of what it is, or does one, uh, how, how does one get the shortcut part of it? Well, I don't like to dwell on the shortcut part, but since you brought it up, <laughs> <laughs> and us being Americans, I mean, who, we love who shortcuts. It? I mean, how long is it gonna take, right. first and second, how much does it cost? Right. And, um, you know, do I have to do it, or can somebody do it for me? That might be the third <laughs> question. In Buddhism, we know the answer is, it's up to oneself. Um, with a little help from our friends and the teachers, the teaching and the spiritual community of kindred spirits helping us on the way, Buddha Dharma Sangha. Um, of course, there's a practice involved, there's a, there's a view, an outlook, there's a way of practicing of meditation, and there's activity and compassionate action in the world, view, meditation, and conduct or action involved. But there's not so much um, ritual, cosmology, and a gradual approach as in some of the different Buddhist yanas or vehicles or paths. It's more about swooping down from above than climbing up from below. Swooping down from above with the bigger picture, being introduced directly to our own innate Buddha nature or Buddhaness as I call it. Trungpa Rinpoche called it our basic goodness, our original goodness as contrasted to our original sin, our original goodness of Buddha nature. That we're all Buddhas by nature. We only have to recognize and realize that fact. We only have to awaken to what we truly are and see the Buddha nature, Buddha-ness, Buddha light in ourselves and in all beings. And that's the um, view, then the meditation of getting used to that, seeing that, actualizing that, checking it out and seeing if it's true or not and going deeper into it. And then comes the, me the action of embodying that in the world, sharing that in the world, embodying it actualizing it in the world. So view, meditation, and action, swooping down from above based on this introduction to the nature of who and what we really are, the nature of Buddha mind within us. As contrasted to the gradual approach of building up from below, as in the Eightfold Path taught by Buddha originally, Eight Steps to Enlightenment, ethics, building up to meditation, concentration, and mindfulness, building up to wisdom and unconditional love, shila, samadhi, and prajna. Mm -hmm. But the Tibetan special outlook on this is not just sudden enlightenment or easy enlightenment. It's simple, but it's not less easy, this great perfection teaching. Swooping while climbing. Swooping down from above with the bigger picture in mind while climbing up the spiritual path or mountain, as it were, from below through relative practices, good works and self-transformation and attitude improvement and so on. 
climbing up the path from below through relative practices according to our inclinations, needs, and capacities. So a swooping while climbing. That's, it's, it's an example of the great middle way uh, taught by Buddha. Mm -hmm. Not too tight, not too loose. So not too much and not too little. Balanced and appropriate, mm -hmm. the middle way. So one starts by swooping, by, by sort of getting a view, getting understanding and, and kind of at least beginning to internalize a view of the original luminous nature of oneself, one mind. Something like and that. And at the same time, though, there's a, and you said there's a climbing. So there's some, there's some effort, there's some yeah. technique, there's right. some, sure. some work involved it's in that It's still as a well. Buddhist path. It's a religious journey to, from illusion to enlightenment. We can't deny that. So one is introduced to the view more from the outset mm -hmm. than the gradual past where you go through more the outer congregational religion and behavioral ways and then the inner attitudinal transformations and purification and transformation and then you get to the secret or innermost mystical non-dual direct access teachings introduced in the beginning to the bigger picture that we're all Buddhas by nature that Buddha is within us, not in the future, in a better rebirth or somewhere else, so, but that we're all Buddhas by nature, and then we have to awaken to that fact. That's the path, that's the work to do. Obviously, the world is also not in necessarily great shape. There's a lot of problems, so we have to work on the relative level uh, here in this life to be better people and contribute to a better world for our children and to uh, protect the planet also. So we can't ignore the relative uh, dimension, the reality. Yes. So again, that's the middle way of Buddhism, absolute swooping and relative climbing at the same time, or like the two wings of the bodhisattva, the wing of absolute, prajna, transcendental wisdom, pure awareness, seeing it as it is, catching it all at once, let's say right-brained, mm -hmm. and left-brained, relative, upaya, skillful means compassionate action in the world. So that's the two wings of the bodhisattva. As a bird needs two wings to fly, the bodhisattva needs these two wings of wisdom and compassion or skillful means and profound realization to soar in the space of freedom. Not just to soar to enlightenment, to get to enlightenment from here to there, but to get from here to totally and truly here. Because now in this awareness, in this non-dual way of teaching of Mahamudra and Dzogchen, non-dual Tibetan mysticism. Now in this awareness is the innate Buddha within mm -hmm. each of us and all of us, not just Buddhists, not just men, not just human beings, all beings endowed with the luminous Buddha nature. I like what you said, to get from here to truly here. So, so it's not getting from here to there. Right. It's getting from here to truly here. Yes. So you get here, back here. to where you started from, as T.S. Eliot said, and you know it for the, as for the, for the, the first, first time. time. Yeah, uh-huh. As if for the first as time. As if That's for the first Buddhist, time. A little Buddhist wisdom speaking. Right. As if for the first time. Right. And does one know it? I mean, do you Absolutely. know it? Do you know yeah. it when Absolutely. that happens? Yeah, it's yeah. self-authenticating. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. If you don't, you can check with your white wife or mate. They'll <laughs> let you know if you're still uh, a schnook or not. Uh-huh. Or, your ma or some other master. Yes. <laughs> yes. Your mate or some other master yes. in your life. Yes. Employees, for instance, employers. Right. Who, who, yeah. any, anybody. Whoever knows you best. With the mirror uh -huh. of, of authentic honesty. If we're uh -huh. true seekers, we have to be honest, at least with ourselves. Self-deception is one of the great pitfalls yes. on the spiritual uh -huh. path. Uh -huh. how, does, um, how does the Buddhist concept of non-self relate to this? Um, does, one, does one practice non-self? Does one fall into it? Does one um, attain a realization that there, there in fact is no self? And, and how does it relate to the, the, you know, the, the primary or primordial luminous state that you talk about? Well, because it's not personal, there's no owner. The translation of anatta, what you're calling not self, in the to traditional Buddhist scriptures. Anatta could also be called no owner or no governor or no separate, independent, truly existent self. It doesn't mean there's nothing. So the notion of Buddha nature is not a separate thing, what you call the luminous primordial nature, you're using Dzogchen terms. Um, it's not a separate thing. So um, mm -hmm. there is a relative self. We have to develop from dependent to independent individuated adulthood become a, and take care of ourselves as a relative self. There's me and there's you, and if I'm hungry, your eating doesn't assuage my hunger, and mm -hmm. so on. But um, 
no self or not to means there's no separate permanent individual, separate being, entity, or self, and the things are contingent, interrelated, interwoven. Thich Nhat Hanh brilliantly calls it interbeing, and that's really the meaning of not self, mm -hmm. not the, so that um, we realize the emptiness of that notion. We see through the limited construct of self even while we still function within the relative sphere as relative selves, as, as functional, individuated adult egos. You don't have to slay the ego, as some people m mistakenly put it, I think. More, let's talk about more uh, being less selfish, more empathic, more connected, and so on. And then we can relate more to the transpersonal self, not just impersonal, not self. There's a transpersonal being, that's more like the Buddha nature. In the Vedanta teachings, they call it self with a capital S, as opposed to the small egocentric, small self. In Zen, they call it mind with a capital M instead of small mind, egocentric, conceptual, limited mind. In Tibet, mm -hmm. we call it uh, mind and awareness, or rigpa. So mm -hmm. the small self is like a bubble in the sea. This is just an analogy. You don't have to burst the bubble. Just see through the bubble, and you realize it's sea outside, inside, and always. And the bu bubble doesn't have to return to the sea by bursting. So that's, I think, the story mm -hmm. of the small self just in an analogy. Yeah. So, so in, in such a state, uh, in, in this state of rigpa, of realization, of enlightenment, of you know, luminous spaciousness, whatever you want to call it, <clears throat> is, there, is there parallel realities going on? There's the relative level of reality in which there is apparently a self, and then there's this other, or, it, or is it something else? Parallel sounds too um, separate. Mm -hmm. Although in the bigger picture, I've, I've heard, you know, my vast studies of science, like reading the Reader's Digest, I found out that parallel lines meet in the horizon. So in the bigger picture, parallel lines may not be separate, but the, the way we think of it is like two separate train tracks, I don't think, or paths, I don't, roads, I don't think that's the best way of thinking about it. It's more like um, co-emergent realities. For example, that we're all very much alike, but we're all different. We're each different DNA, personality, or other things, but we're very much alike. The Homo sapiens or the, the mammals, you know, whatever, 90% mm -hmm. water, and uh, many other ways we're m more alike than different. So can we accommodate this apparent contradiction of the same or alike and different at the same time? We have to stretch our mind a little bit to comprehend these things, and that's where the middle way comes in. It's not either or, it could be both or neither. Like an electron, even science understands now, can be a wave, can be a particle, can mm -hmm. be both or neither. Mm -hmm. So it's more like coexistent realities, like two sides mm -hmm. of the hand. Mm -hmm. Are they separate or the same? Where does one end and the other begin? And so forth. So the absolute and the relative are inseparable. So according to this way of looking at things, samsara and nirvana are inseparable. That's Mahayana Buddhist teaching. Not special Tibetan Dzogchen teaching, Vajrayana Diamond Path teaching. Samsara and nirvana inseparable, not getting from this world of worldliness, samsara, confusion and suffering, to the island or other world of nirvana, bliss and peace, no. Um, the, the two are one, going deeper, awakening to what's here and now, we realize the ultimate reality within the relative, the infinite within the finite, the timeless within time, and so on. Horizontal mm -hmm. time and vertical time intersecting in every moment. We call it Dzogchen. The fourth time, the Shicha, the nowness. This moment, this moment, it's always now. And yet we live in relative time. We grow old and age in relative time. But this is always fresh. This is the eternal, timeless now. Mm -hmm. And although Buddhists will say like a mantra, like a catechism, I would say, everything is impermanent. Buddha never said that. Buddha said all conditioned things are impermanent. He also talked about a few things that were not impermanent. Space, because it's not compounded, put together, doesn't have parts, and nirvana. He called it deathless, timeless nirvana. So that's right here and now. Mm -hmm. What we seek is right here and now, Rob. The problem is we're usually elsewhere, mm -hmm. distracted, dissociated, not paying attention. It's in the Dzogchen way of looking at it, there's um, four deviations from the view or this outlook, the realization of things as they truly are. Again, not separate, not parallel. Mm -hmm. How it really is, is it, whatever we call it, it is so close that we overlook it. Mm -hmm. 
It seems too good to be true that we can hardly believe it. What? It's in me? It's in everything? It's in every. How could that be? How could Nirvana be here? I want to go and visit Tibet. Okay, go and visit Tibet. But you still have to come home, or even if you live there. There are Tibetans that want to move to America, yeah. believe me. Sure. Yeah. And get a car and a washing machine. Yeah. Yeah. So it seems too good to be true. We can hardly believe it. That's a second deviation. The third is it's not outside ourselves, as we usually shop and reach for things that uh, we want. So we can't get it. Mm -hmm. which is our usual way of looking for what we want. And fourth, it's too obvious or clear or evident, so we see right through it, we don't notice it, we don't appreciate it. Like the poet Kabir sang, it's like the fish who doesn't know the sea mm -hmm. that they live in. Mm -hmm. So this is how we overlook it and miss it. It's right here, the problem is we're usually elsewhere. That's where these great awareness practices of the contemplative traditions, particularly now we're talking about Buddhism, we're talking about Dzogchen, these great contemplative awareness practices come in to be more aware of what's here and now, who and what we are. Uh, not just the half of the glass that's empty or the half that's full, but the whole situation. And to take it more lightly, th there's great freedom and peace in that and things as they are. Buddha himself said, there's nirvanic peace and things left as they are. So that's not, after many lifetimes, that's not on the other shore, that's not off the wheel of samsara. Samsara, nirvana, inseparable. So anyway, that's the basis of Mahayana Buddhism and particularly Mahamudra slash Dzogchen, the great perfection teachings or the ultimate stance, outlook, Mahamudra teachings, the non-dual mysticism of Tibet, sort of enlightenment now teachings. Well, thank you for that really comprehensive explanation, that's really good. So it's right here and we're usually elsewhere. <laughs> that's right. that's, that's why I'm taking away from that. That's why mindfulness is so useful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's why meditation is so useful. But not just crossing your legs, crossing your eyes, crossing your fingers and hoping to get a mind. Mm -hmm. Mindfulness in any position. Yes. Awareness in any moment. Awareness is moment. curative. Awareness mm -hmm. is the alpha and omega of Buddhist practice. Right. Right. And whatever you call it, I like to call it presencing, so it's not just meditation, which we think of as sitting quietly. Presencing, cultivating presence of mind and alert lucidity in every action, every moment. That's the way, at least that's the way of awakening in Buddhism. Yes. To reality here and now. So not parallel, but coexistent, inextricably inseparable, and delightful, a, yes. a joyous awakening. Yes. Where every step of the way to nirvana is nirvanic to paraphrase. Right, yeah. Being there while getting there every step of the way. Being right here while getting there, not waiting. No pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. It's all rainbow, big circle. Uh -huh. In fact, there is no getting there. There's only being being here. If, you put, if you're waiting to get there, when you get some, the next place you'll be waiting. Because right. right. we're con conditioned. Right. It's karma conditioning. Right. Re re enforcing the habit of waiting and pr procrastinating and postponing. Mm -hmm. Back to the now, the virtues of the now, the power of now, which is an ancient teaching. I mean, the new now, you know, the nowness ain't what it seem, used to be. <laughs> we have to take a new take on it. Uh -huh. It doesn't preclude remembering. Remembering is a function of nowness awareness. Uh -huh. Are you in the past or are you now when you remember? Well. Planning the future is a nowness activity. So this is part of what we call in the Mahamudra Dzogchen tradition, introduction to the nature of mind. It's all nowness awareness. Mm -hmm. There's no distraction when you're not trying to concentrate on one thing and you're just panoramically aware. Then what would you be distracted from if you're not concentrating on one thing? Mm -hmm. And you can be aware of everything as it pops and disappears. So letting go doesn't just mean throwing away or suppressing. It means letting things come and go, letting be, as it is. And as it is is a great Dzogchen slogan. Seeing it as it is, as it is. Uh -huh. being as is, allowing. It's hard to express the ineffable, mm -hmm. but there's a, there's a joy to it. That's why I always say Dzogchen is more fun. And I don't mean that in, in a partisan, sectarian, or comparative term. Mm -hmm. It's a lightness. Mm -hmm. There's a lightness to it. Anyway, it works for me. That's why I think it's best <laughs> for me. Does, a, does an awakened person, an enlightened person, um, um, get angry, fearful, anxious? Uh, those are good questions. I don't know. Did you ask Tukumindra Rinpoche, who seems prone to panic attacks? Mm -hmm. What did he say? He said that... Because um, he's quite a realized young master. Mm -hmm. 
Well, he said that everything is an opportunity for mindfulness right. and awareness. Everything's possible. And then, and, and as long within the field of awareness, you know, there yeah. is awakening and light. Right. Yeah. So that's not that explicit, but I'll, put, I'll be, give you a more American answer, which okay. is personally just my opinion. Um, th there's room for anything. That doesn't mean enlightened people uh, go around um, shooting up schoolyards or shooting up heroin, but uh, just you asked about anger or fear and mm -hmm. so on. These are, there's a, an emotional emotions. intelligence to them too. Yeah, the kaleshas, the obscuring emotions, whatever you want to call them. Mm -hmm. Um, so if somebody's part. getting mugged in the street, you're supposed to feel anger and the adrenaline surge so you can try to help them. That's what we call wrathful activity mm -hmm. in Vajrayana Buddhism. So it's not just personal anger based on fear or, you know, I'm angry because you're threatening me. There's an enlightened side to it, like seeing what's wrong brings up an energy. It's like the wrath of the wrathful deities, not always being a peaceful um, pacifist and quietist. So there's quite an energy, an outrageous energy to the awakeful state. So I suppose uh, there could be anger or uh, any of the human emotions as long as you're in a human body and you could also feel pain. I guess, I know masters have died for cancer and other things and had some pain and a, a great master even said, I don't want to die on his deathbed. And the disciples were shocked. <laughs> what? No, master, give us your final word of wisdom. He said, I really don't want to die. <laughs> then he died. That's the human nature. But human nature is Buddha nature, not separate from it, uh -huh. not a parallel reality. Uh -huh. so, so where does, where does, um, where does social transformation come in? So, so here at the Garrison Institute, you know, we're all about exploring the intersection between personal and social transformation. So is social transformation actually, is it different than personal transformation? I mean, if everyone, if everyone got enlightened, would we have social transformation? No. No, I don't think so no. either. But that's a big if. Yeah, right. And I don't know that it's gonna happen. That's like a utopian vision. A Buddha's, Buddha never said that everyone's gonna get enlightened. Right. Yeah. So um, wh what we can say is that anybody can get enlightened, and millions have, not just one Buddha. Mm -hmm. So that's a good news. Mm -hmm. Social transformation has always been part of it. Buddha was a great social reformer. Out of his sitting under the tree, out of his renouncing his palace and family and world and dedicating himself for m many years to seeking nirvana or enlightenment, peace, freedom. Um, he broke the caste system. He was the first in history to educate women. Uh, in a way, he was the first uh, tree hugger, ecologist that uh, we know of. He exhorted his followers to plant the tree or trees every year to replenish the earth for resources used. He exhorted them not to soil the waters. In other words, there was no plumbing in those days. Don't do dirty in the waters. Um, he brokered peace between warring kingdoms. So I think that's a good model. And the bodhisattva model of the social altruist, the spiritual warrior, whatever you want to call it, the bodhisattva, the enlightened leader, the edifier and awakener is a great model for us today, working on um, awakening ourselves, awakening all, mm -hmm. awakening the world. So it's always been, in my view, a socially activist, spiritual active model. Of course, in the old world, things were a little more uh, fragmented. Society was less mobile than here. People were in this caste or this profession forever, or that marriage or that profession forever of their parents and grandparents. And here we're much more socially mobile, so people can go in and out of um, contemplative life or long time schooling, or on the other hand, social action. Like doctors study so much, they probably don't do much social action while they're growing up, but then they have a great opportunity to serve and heal later. Mm -hmm. So similarly, monks and nuns go for training for many years, and then they start to um, act in the world. Some orders are more reclusive, but in general, everybody had some vocation and some relation to the society around them. So today, I think social action is very important. In fact, um, I know Peter Senge, and he's a brilliant thinker. I know he teaches here. And he said that he didn't think that today was the time for think and talk so much about individual transformation as collective transformation. And that really struck a chord with me because I grew up like him in the 60s and you know, 
a lot of this was about personal growth. And of course, we were all involved in the peace movement and anti-war Vietnam movement and things like that. But uh, many of us who went to the Eastern teachings, which is where I'm coming from now, uh, very much about you know enlightenment and spiritual realization and finding ourselves. And some are still not so socially active. So I think that, uh, I mean, my teachings are always view meditation and action, including the action, mm -hmm. compassion and action. And being a lay person in the world, I try to live the bodhisattva ethic, the bodhisattva way, and um, have a contemplative inner life and hours a day doing that, and then be some kind of social activist, spiritual activist, make a difference and contribute to the world. We're all in the same boat. We all rise or fall, sink or swim together, especially in this increasingly socially mobile, shrinking globe where we're also interdependent as people are finally starting to realize interdependence. And, teaching of thousands of years ago from Buddha as well as other um, sages. Your, your, your structure or, or rubric of view, meditation, and action is, is very interesting. That's classic Tibetan Buddhist That's teaching about Mahamudra slash Dzogchen, mm -hmm. the non-dual teachings. Mm -hmm. In relation to, to looking at how personal and social transformation fuel one another, work together, um, do you think there's something inherent in contemplative practice that is, and the wisdom that comes from that, the wisdom and compassion and view that comes from that, that is a missing ingredient, if not the missing ingredient in social transformation and changing systems. The reason I ask is that we, we here at the Institute, you know, we have contemplation and Yes. Fill in the blank. Contemplation right. and education. I contemplation like Contemplation and, and ecology. Contemplation and trauma work. Yes. Because our assumption is that that is, uh, if not the missing ingredient in creating true right. social change. Well, I like that thinking, and I appreciate the and. Often it used to be verses. Mm -hmm. You know, like monastic at conferences, monasticism versus lay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Preservation versus adaptation. And we all try to say and. Preservation and adaptation. So mm -hmm. contemplation and action. So I don't know if it's entirely fair to say I don't like um, totalizing concepts. That I don't know if it's entirely fair to say that the missing ingredient from social action is contemplation. But to put it simply, yeah, I think that social action is a little... Um, like we see it in Christianity and Judaism over the years, although there is an undercurrent of mysticism well pushed down in modern centuries. Social action is always seen as outward, outreach and for others and with others. So we're kind of uh, getting imbalanced without the inner dimension, the contemplative dimension, the mystical dimension, contemplative dimension, personal development. So I think that it's a good rebalancing to bring those two back to balance as they should be. Mm -hmm. And I also think that what's lacking in a lot, and we can see this in with a lot of social activists, in, in the f and not just literal social activists, but so many people in the helping professions, and not just helping professions, so many people, parents and everybody, burnout is a problem. And I think having a rich inner life provides a great deeper well. So we're not just pouring out our large or small pitcher of gifts and energy that we have and love that we have to give. We're in touch with the boundless, inexhaustible source of it. Call it the higher power if you're a theistic thinker. Call it you know, your selfless Buddha nature, whatever, so that you don't get burned out so easily. And then you have more fuel from the inexhaustible inner source that you can be in touch mm -hmm. with to keep giving and pouring it out and being there for others and making a difference. And so I think um, contemplation and action go very well together. Mm -hmm. And I try to balance them myself. And also in different parts of your life, sometimes you do more of one, sometimes you do more of the other. Sometimes you do more uh, work from the outside in with good deeds and purification and with others. Sometimes more from the inside out in noble silence and noble solitude and self-inquiry and prayer life, contemplative life whatever you want to call that, introspection, meditation, retreat. But even monks and nuns in Buddhism who've gone forth from the world, gone into solitude, there's a purpose for that. It's to bring something back. 
and the bringing back is, as it says in the Zen story, coming back to the marketplace like a happy laughing Buddha Santa with a big bag on your back of gifts for the children, meaning for all beings. That's the notion of bringing back. Mm -hmm. You can call that social action, but that's bigger than that. Yes. Just good parenting, being a good neighbor, yes. et cetera. And being ordinary, losing yourself amidst everybody, not being special is social action. And, that and treating everybody in an I and thou manner, seeing the, the Buddha, the do divine, and everyone and everything. And that brings us back to, to sort of where we started from, whether you're coming from inside out or outside in. It seems like the key <coughs> movement, if you will, is to be really here, not to be, not to be right. going there, but to be really here yeah. you know, in the spaciousness and the luminousness of the present moment, which is what the practice yes. brings you to anyway. To the extent we can be, and that's what practice occurs. Yeah. So practice makes perfect from the progressive point of view, climbing up from below, and practice is perfect from the t swooping down yeah. point of view. Practice is perfect, like Mike, we just do it. Surya <laughs> Das, thank you. It's a pleasure to have you here. Pleasure thank to you. talk with you. Joyous Dharma, and it's beautiful here at Garrison Institute in this beautiful park on the banks of the mighty Hudson. Thank you.